the accept button. Thank you everyone for being here. Mm -hmm. And pretty much right at um, the top of the hour, I'll press um, start webinar and you will see participants starting to come in. All right, I'm gonna do that right now. Krishna, are you almost ready? Barbara? I'm ready. Okay, I'm gonna go off video and mute. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for ASME's Tech Talks. These talks are a monthly one hour webinar series that will focus on topical subject matter in a variety of me mechanical engineering disciplines represented by ASME's technical divisions. I'm Barbara Zlotnick, Senior Manager, Technical and Engineering Communities at ASME. I'm joined here with Dr. Tom Lavertu, who, will be here, who we will be hearing from next, as well as our Tech Talk presenter, Dr. Kelly Senecal. Tom? Thank you, Barbara, and hello to everyone. I'm Tom LaVertue, the Internal Combustion Engine Division Chair. We're very excited to have Dr. Kelly Seneca with us today to give his talk on the internal combustion engine's role in a decarbonizing society. Before we get started with the talk, I'd just like to give a little background on the Internal Combustion Engine Division. It's an exciting year for us. It's our 100th year anniversary as the Internal Combustion Engine Division. We are in place to develop and advance the state of the art of the internal combustion engine. And we do this through networking and events that bring together everyone from newcomers uh, to leading technology experts in the field to meet in a friendly atmosphere. This is usually done through our main event, which is the internal combustion engine fall technical conference, which is held every, every year during the fall timeframe with roughly 200 to 250 attendees and uh, technical presentations ranging from 80 to 100, uh, which we strive to have high quality technical content. In addition, we invite leading experts in the field to give keynote presentations and also panel sessions. This year's event, which we held virtually from October 13th through the 15th, we had originally planned for this to be our 100th year celebration, but given the virtual nature of this year's event, we're gonna postpone that to next year so we can do that in person, which we feel is more appropriate. I'd like to invite everyone to please plan on attending this conference to hear some great technical presentations and do some virtual networking. Other events which we are working on putting together include a webinar series, which will lead up to this year's internal combustion fall conference. Uh, this will be a series of talks uh, which will follow on the de decarbonization talk and get into a little more detail on the specific topics that Kelly will be presenting today. As many folks know, the internal combustion engine has been around for over a century, but there's still a lot of work to be done. The de decarbonization of society it provides both a challenge and an opportunity for the internal combustion engine to be part of the solution as we move forward and to rem uh, remain um, at the forefront as we move into fight climate change, change through the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. With that, we can transition to today's talk. Kelly Senecal is a co-founder and owner of Convergent Science. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, co-founder and director of the Computational Chemistry Consortium and associate editor of the Journal of Transportation Engineering. Before we get started and hand off this off to Dr. Senecal, I'd like to let our audience know that there'll be time for questions and answers after the conclusion of the tech talk. As you think of questions, please submit them through the Q&A box located within your Zoom screen. All right, Dr. Senecal, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
for that introduction, Tom. So my name is Kelly Senegal, and I'll be talking to you today about the IC engine's role in a decarbonizing society. But before I begin, I wanna make sure I thank a few people. First of all, the ASME staff uh, for not only hosting this webinar today, but for really giving our division this platform to speak to a wider ASME audience. And I'm really thrilled here to be representing the Internal Combustion Engine Division, along with our current chair, Tom LaVirtue, who you just heard from. So thanks a lot, Tom, for that very nice introduction. Okay, I have a pretty difficult task ahead of me in the next 30 minutes. Okay, I'm not gonna necessarily try to convince you of this, but I at least wanna get you to open your mind to the idea that decarbonization and internal combustion are not mutually exclusive. Now, if I were doing this presentation live, if we were all in the same room together, I would ask for a show of hands. You know, how many of you think that this statement is crazy? How many of you think I'm crazy maybe for making this statement? Now, fortunately for you guys, we're on Zoom. And so you can raise your hand all you want and I won't know who you are. But hopefully toward the end of this talk, you're at least lowering your hand a little bit. And I know a lot of you in the audience probably do agree with this, uh, but I also know that some of you uh, probably do not. Okay, now this talk uh, is gonna be fairly high level. I'm gonna touch on a lot of different points. I'm not gonna go super deep technically into any of them because I don't wanna steal the thunder uh, from our webinar speakers that will be coming up in the series that Tom mentioned uh, earlier. So we will be having this webinar series from the Internal Combustion Engine Division on the future of the Internal Combustion Engine. So stay tuned for that. Okay, let's start out with why decarbonization, right? We hear this word all the time in the media, we hear it in government announcements, we hear it in industry announcements. Companies are consistently talking about going carbon neutral or net zero by 2040, 2050, some date in the future. And this is a good thing, right? We, we wanna do this, but why, why are we doing this? And I think everybody uh, in the audience probably knows, but Earth has a fever and we believe this is caused by man-made global warming, right? Okay, so let's look at some numbers to put this into context. For the 10,000 years before the Industrial Revolution, the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere was about 260 to 280 parts per million per unit volume. Okay, now fast forward through the Industrial Revolution into modern times, and today, or in 2020 at least, we are at about 416 parts per million per unit volume of CO2. Okay, now that's a, that's a really large increase, actually. And how high can that go before we start to feel the effects of large scale climate change? Well, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC recommends a limit of one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperature levels. Okay, and some might say this, it, this corresponds to 450 parts per million per unit volume. Uh, I don't know if this is true. I don't know if anyone knows for sure. And we really won't know for sure until we hit that limit, right? We start to see the effects of large scale climate change. So how about let's not find out, right? Let's not, let's not come close to that limit. Let's do everything we can to decarbonize now and stay, stay clear of that upper limit. Okay, so where do the greenhouse gas emissions come from that are causing this problem, right? So here's a breakdown, and this is globally speaking, and this is a global greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector. Now this data is a little bit out of date, but the story is fairly close to the same today where you have electricity and heat production as the primary culprit at 25%. And then you have a close second at 24%, agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Then you have industry. And then in red there, you have transportation. Okay, then you have other energy and then you have buildings. Let's go back to the red block, transportation. That's really what we're gonna focus on today. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on light duty transportation. So things like cars, pickup trucks, SUVs, vans. Now, if you look at that, that's more like 16% today globally. And if you look at the developed nations, light duty alone is more like 16%, whereas uh, the total transportation sector is 16% globally, okay? So I don't know if that was a little confusing, but I think some of you are probably wondering, well, wait a minute, the ship has sailed already for light duty, right? We already know how we're gonna decarbonize that. We're gonna go all electric. Right, so that's, we'll talk a little bit about why I think, yes, that's part of the solution, but not the full solution uh, throughout this talk. Okay, so why is light duty transportation a problem? We'll look at all the cars on the road. We have over a billion cars on the road, right? And 99% of them are powered, at least partially, by internal combustion engines. Now, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics 
looks at this kind of a different way and they, they have this neat plot showing millions of miles driven per year. And this is in the United States alone. So between 1960 and 2017, if you look at 2017, we drove over 3.2 trillion miles, that's with a T, in 2017. That's a huge number. If we look at that a different way, we drove over 100,000 miles per second in 2017. Okay, so it's no surprise, right, that all of this driving is having an effect on the environment, and this is what we need to kind of clean up. Okay, so what do we do? Well, an extreme solution might be we stop making cars and we stop driving, right? We just walk everywhere, maybe ride bikes, right? Now, this is a good solution for, you know, urban areas, you know, for close distances, right? If you don't have to travel very far. And a lot of people do this today. It's not only good for your health, but it's also good for the planet. I could certainly use more walking in my daily routine, uh, but this isn't practical for everybody, right? We have longer distances we have to go. And so we need, we need some sort of personal transportation or perhaps public transportation, right? This is another good solution, right? So the more people you fit on this, it's gonna take this route anyway, day, day in and day out, the more people you put on there, the better it's gonna be, right? And so the problem with this is since COVID-19 hit, especially uh, people are worried about exposure, right? So they don't necessarily wanna get on public transportation and be close to a lot of different people. They kind of want their own car. So cars are gonna be around in some form, I believe, uh, for quite some time. But certainly public transportation, walking and biking are definitely part of the solution as well. Okay, so we're going to have cars for a while. Well, they're going to be all electric and so we kind of solve the problem, right? So people who would say that would say the future is electric. Now, I apologize for those of you who follow me on social media. You've seen this many times. You're probably sick of me saying it by now. But I say the future is eclectic. So that's a play on words, obviously, but it's a pretty powerful statement when you think about it. What do I mean by eclectic? I mean a mix of technologies, including both electrification and internal combustion engines. I believe that's the short to medium term future of transportation. Uh, long term, way into the future, I don't know, right? But at least in the foreseeable future, I believe this is what we need to strive for. Uh, and the most important word on that Again, the most important word on that slide is and, right? So I don't think internal combustion engines alone are the solution. I don't think battery electric vehicle vehicles are alone are the solution. I think it's a combination of the two. Okay, so you're probably wondering, well, internal combustion engines, they're consistently demonized in the media and a lot of people would say that they're dead. And a lot of this came from Dieselgate, right? Dieselgate was this big scandal uh, back in 2015 is when it broke. And there was cheating going on, right? So the emissions that were measured in the lab were different from the emissions that you would see on the road, okay? Not that it had to be that way, right? You could certainly achieve the lab laboratory emissions on the road, but they were programmed such that that was the case. And so this led to big fines, jail time, and honestly, a huge stain on the internal combustion engine, not only diesel engines, but also uh, gasoline engines as well. So there was a lot of media back few years ago, 2017 is when a lot of this started coming out. And maybe one of the more famous uh, sources was from The Economist, this cover from one of their magazines and they call it Roadkill and they have the internal combustion engine laying dead on the side of the road with its legs up in the air. Um, you know, the internal combustion engine is dead. And that year there was a ton of media that came out, right? Volvo sort of led the charge. And again, it wasn't Volvo, who said this, it was the media taking what Volvo said and kind of spinning it uh, to make it more sensationalized. But historic end for combustion, Volvo says all of its cars will use electric after 2019. Another one, Volvo to make only electric cars in 2019, marking the end of the petrol engine. Well, I don't know about you, but if I go to the, if I go to the Volvo website today in 2021, I can certainly buy uh, a, a Volvo with an internal combustion engine in it. Okay, some more headlines, you, you know, governments and countries are starting to get in on the action. China says it will stop selling internal combustion engine cars. They didn't set a date, but the message is clear electric is the future. Britain bans gasoline and diesel starting in 2050. Now, if you follow this, uh, this has evolved quite a bit over the years, and actually their ban is, is even more uh, strict than this. They're, they've moved that date up. Okay, France wants to ditch gas and diesel powered cars by 2040. China, again, is banning traditional auto engines. It's aim, electric car domination. 
Toyota will electrify the entire vehicle lineup by 2025. Now, this is another interesting one where Toyota, what Toyota actually said in their press is they said all of our vehicles will have electrified options in 2025. Now, an electrified option is anything from a mild hybrid all the way up to a fully electric vehicle. A lot of those still have internal combustion engines in them, right? And so, but again, as far as the news was concerned, it was, they were going all electric. India to sell only electric cars by 2030. And let's end back on Volvo again. Again, Volvo wasn't saying this. They were saying something quite different, but the news was Volvo creates an historic first and says goodbye to the internal combustion engine. Okay, so that was kind of the state of play in 2017. Now, I believe my son is in the audience, my older son, he's 16 years old. Uh, he just turned 16, just got his driver's license, which is, which is awesome, right? He's about to experience the kind of freedom you have when you can drive a car, right? And it's great for parents because we don't have to drive them everywhere. Okay, but back in 2017, when he was 13-ish, he had to do a science project, okay? And the thesis he was writing on was kind of the answer to this question. What is the most climate friendly today? A car with an electric motor or a car with an IC engine? And you would think I had a lot of influence over this topic. My son actually doesn't like it when I try to interfere with his schoolwork. He likes to be totally independent, do his own research. Uh, maybe he watched my TEDx talk, I don't know. Um, but his answer was, it depends. And that made me very proud when I saw this because it does depend, okay? And why does it depend? Well, let's look at this cartoon. Many of you have probably seen this. It's made its rounds uh, around the internet in the last few years. This is from Marian Kamensky, an artist from Aust Austria. And in the top picture, you have a gentleman driving his diesel car, spitting out all this black smoke out of the tailpipe and he feels very dirty, right? Now, as a side note, modern engines in cars don't do that, right? So our combustion systems have advanced enough, our after treatment systems have advanced enough that we've effectively solved, I, I'm gonna be bold here and I'm gonna say we've effectively solved the criteria pollutants problem other than for things like cold starting and a few other, other cases. But in any case, he feels dirty, he feels shamed for, for driving that diesel car. Where you have the gentleman driving the electric vehicle, he feels very clean, he's happy if you can see the smile on his face, right? He doesn't have a tailpipe. But how does he get the electricity to charge that electric vehicle, right? And so a lot of that depends on where you are in the world. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. In this case, looks like it's a coal fired power plant, right? So he's not as clean as, as he thinks he is. Okay, so let's, let's hit on this electricity generation thing a little bit more. Okay, so in the USA in 1985, about two thirds or 67% of our electricity came from non-renewable sources from fossil fuels. Now, 30 years later in 2015, this looked pretty much the same. Now, there was a very positive switch from coal to natural gas in a lot of cases, right? So that's a very good thing and that definitely helps the carbon footprint, but still about two thirds. Now, today in 2021, this would be a bit lower, maybe closer to 60%, 61, 62%, something like that. But still a large portion of our electricity comes from fossil fuels. Okay, China in 2015 was 75%. And then Norway, now here's a country where if you're the guy in the bottom of that cartoon and you're driving your electric vehicle, you can feel pretty, pretty darn good about being clean, right? Because 90% of their electricity comes from renewable resources, mainly hydroelectric. Okay, so Norway is, Norway is a pretty special case. Okay, so given that background, I'm gonna ask you again, especially the people that maybe didn't agree with my initial statement there to rethink emissions, right? And what do I mean by rethink emissions? Well, most of the discussion around emissions today and certainly the legislation, right? So how these vehicles are legislated, it all focuses on the tailpipe, right? So we draw our control volume or a circle around the tailpipe and that's where we care about the emissions. Well, battery electric vehicles don't have a tailpipe, right? So that's why you often see, or you probably very frequently see this phrase zero emissions vehicles, right? We know there's no such thing as a zero emissions vehicle, but because they have no tailpipe, they're tagged as such, not only in, not only in the media and, and by a lot of people out there, but also in legislation, which is a big problem. Okay, but emissions are more than just the tailpipe. We have to look at the entire vehicle, right? So on the right-hand side, you have a gasoline-powered vehicle. On the left-hand side, you have a, an electric vehicle, a battery electric vehicle. Now, again, on the left-hand side, that car doesn't have a tailpipe, but you also have something called non-exhaust particulate emissions, 
which are generated from things like tire wear, brake wear, road wear, as you're driving. Now for electric vehicles and their defense, they have regenerative braking typically and that, that reduces the, the brake wear, non-exhaust particulates quite a bit, but there's still a lot of tire and, and road wear, right? And the heavier your vehicle is, and we know battery electric vehicles are often pretty heavy with these big battery packs, the more of those non-exhaust particulates you'll get. And we're at, we're at a point now because our after treatment is so good, the exhaust portion of the particulates has come down so much over the last several years that it's kind of on par with the non-exhaust value. We don't legislate the non-exhaust value. So this idea again, that you know the, the vehicle on the left is a zero emissions vehicle um, has a lot of problems. Okay, let's take it one more step and now look beyond the vehicle. And we already talked about this a little bit, but how is the electricity being produced to charge the vehicle? So we have to count that in our control volume when we, when we judge the emissions from a vehicle. Now I'm gonna exaggerate a bit here and I'm gonna draw the control volume around the whole planet. And what I'm trying to do is get across the point of life cycle analysis. So this is something where you try to determine the emissions from every aspect of the vehicle, right? So from mining of the, of the materials to, to building the vehicle, to using the vehicle, whether you're gassing it up or you're charging it, and then even end of life. What do you do when the car is done? How do you recycle the parts? Right, so life cycle analysis is really something that we need to do more of to fairly compare vehicles, not only in, in academic studies, but in legislation, right? Now, the problem with LCA, even though it's, it's the best thing we have going for us right now, there are, it's very compli complicated, right? There are a lot of assumptions that have to be made, right? So you can, if you have a certain outcome in mind, oh, I want the battery electric vehicle to look cleaner, or I want the IC engine vehicle to look cleaner. You can certainly do that with how you make your assumptions. So there's a lot of bias that can come into play in an LCA. So when you're examining an LCA, I would say, take a look at the assumptions and take a look at who funded the study, right? And by looking at both of those, you can usually tell, is this a biased LCA or did they at least attempt to be somewhat neutral, right? So. Here's an example of an LCA from the literature. This is a study by Kawamoto et al. It came out in 2019. Now here's a good example of perhaps biased assumptions. Now people look at this study, especially uh, battery electric vehicle proponents, and they would say, well, this is biased because they assumed uh, CO2 from battery production level that's extremely high. So they assumed 177 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour of creating that battery. So creating these battery packs is very carbon intense. Um, and what value you choose for that can really swing your LCA one way or another. Now, I look at that and I say, well, at the time they were taking um, kind of an average. In fact, in the paper, they say it was an average and they list various sources of what that value is. 177 is what they used. Since then, newer numbers have come out and we believe as a community, I think, at least I do, that that's, that's on the high side. We should be using something quite a bit lower um, although it does, it does depend on where your battery is produced. So in a study I'll show you in a few minutes, we will lose, use lower values for that. But for this study, don't worry about the details about which vehicle wins, which vehicle loses. I just wanna use this to show you the different aspects of the LCA and also how it depends on where you are in the world, okay? So here we have CO2 emissions as a function of driving distance, okay, in thousands of kilometers. And they looked at a production phase. You can see that light blue band around zero. So not from driving the car, but just from building the car, how much CO2 was produced. Then you have the use phase, which is the big part in the middle. And then you have the end of life. And this, by the way, the EU there stands for European Union. So this is for the European Union. Okay, the end of life wasn't considered in their study. So you're gonna see the CO2 just kind of flatten off there. But I included, included it here because in a very thorough LCA, you would definitely have end of life. Okay, let's look at a gasoline vehicle. Again, this is for the EU. So the production CO2, it's non-zero, right? It takes, it, we create CO2 when we build that car. And then clearly the use phase of a gasoline vehicle is where we're gonna create most of the CO2. And then the end of life, again, it's just flattening off. If we look at a diesel vehicle, the curve is fairly similar. The production CO2 is about the same, but uh, the diesel you know, is more efficient, which is why they've been so popular in Europe up until recently. We create a lot less CO2 driving them. And so you see a lower value uh, of CO2. Now, the really interesting one is the battery electric vehicle. And here's where that assumption comes into play. If that 177 value that I quoted earlier, if that's too high, 
or too low, I guess, then that's going to really shift where that production CO2 uh, level is, right? Right now, it's significantly higher than the gasoline and the diesel, and it should be higher. That is an intense process, making the battery, making the batteries on CO2. But how much higher dictates where that yellow curve crosses over with the green and the red curves? And so where, you know, initially in the early lifetime, the battery electric vehicle is more CO2 intense, eventually it crosses over and it may be less CO2 intense over the entire lifetime. Okay, so that's a very important, important factor to take into consideration. But let's look at this now for other regions in the world. So they also did this study for Japan. And then on the bottom row, you see Australia, China, and the United States. Okay, they didn't do diesel for all of these. They just did diesel for the top row. But what you see is different results. Again, don't worry too much about which one wins or loses, but what you want to take note of is that in some areas, one wins and in some areas, the other one wins, right? Okay, so in Australia, for example, the gasoline vehicle using these assumptions and these numbers wins on CO2. In the USA, the battery electric vehicle wins. Now, there are two problems that I see with this LCA besides the fact that you can question their assumptions, right? One is they didn't consider a hybrid. And I like to say you should have at least a small battery in every vehicle, right? You should, every vehicle should at least be mild hybrid, if not more, right? So electrification is very important uh, to the overall system and I think we should have it. So if they put a hybrid vehicle on here, it would look quite a bit better on CO2 than the gasoline and diesel. The other thing I don't like about this study, well, the other thing I have an issue with is you can see there's one curve for each vehicle type for the entire United States, right? That means they use the total electricity mix or the average electricity mix for the whole country to do this LCA. And that's actually something that's very commonly done. Most LCAs do that that you see in the literature. That's a problem. And that's something I'm gonna talk about in a minute that we need to fix. Okay, so good transition because here's how we're going to fix it, or at least one way to fix it. Here's an example where we looked at a battery electric vehicle versus a full hybrid electric vehicle, again, in the U.S. And this is a study that's, that's been led by and is being led by Tristan Burton, who's an engineer here at Convergent Science. And we're doing this study along with uh, Southwest Research, University of Oxford, and believe it or not, a statistician from the L.A. Dodgers. So... We can talk about that later, but he's a brilliant statistician who happens to work for the LA Dodgers, who's helping us uh, with some of the statistics here, okay? So let's just review quickly, because we're going to be looking at a full hybrid. What is a hybrid vehicle? There's different types. There's serial, parallel, power split. We don't need to worry about the details for this, okay? All we have to worry about for now is hybrids have both an IC engine and an electric motor battery pack, right? And they kind of split the load in... in propulsion for these vehicles. Okay, we're going to specifically look at a Kia Niro. Okay, the Kia Niro is nice because this car comes in battery electric, full battery electric. It comes in full hybrid. And I think it also maybe comes in plug-in hybrid, but we didn't consider that here. So you can actually compare, it's an apples to apples comparison, right? You're comparing the same, comparing the same vehicle. Typically in these LCAs, they'll do like a Tesla Model 3 versus like a BMW 3 Series or something like that. Well, there's some differences in those vehicles besides the fact that, you know, one's a battery electric and one's an IC engine. We're here, we're using the same vehicle and we're looking at different versions of it. So that's a really nice thing. Now, this slide is very busy. Don't worry about the details. Um, remember I said earlier, you have to be, you have to be uh, aware of people's assumptions when they do LCAs. So I tried to throw a bunch of the assumptions on a slide just so they're there for reference. All of the details will be in an upcoming paper that we hope to publish. Uh, but this is showing what we calculated was the equivalent CO2 emissions rate. So grams of CO2 per kilometer driven. And we did that for the battery electric. So ER, BEV is the battery electric emissions rate. And then the, the full hybrid, the ERFHEV is the full hybrid uh, emissions rate. And here's showing some of the Again, don't worry too much about these assumptions, but just kind of, it's in small type, but if you look toward the bottom of the slide, you can see that 61 to 106 kilogram CO2 per kilowatt hour number. That's in comparison to the 177 that Kawamoto used. So 61 to 106 is something that's maybe more accepted, at least by more of the community um, today, right? It's based, on, it's based on newer data. And so, it, but there's still quite a range, 61 to 106. So instead of picking the high value or picking the low value 
and possibly biasing the study one way or the other, we looked at both, right? We said, well, what happens if we do assumptions that favor the battery electric vehicle more? What happens if we do assumptions that favor the battery electric vehicle less? And let's look at both and then we can kind of make a determination from there. Okay, the other problem I had with that Kawamoto study was the average or total electricity emission rate. So which electricity emission rate should we use then if we're not gonna use total? So just to review though, the total emission rate is the sum of the total electricity production, CO2, divided by the total electricity produced on the grid. Super easy to calculate, right? If you know in the United States, say we have this much coal, this much natural gas, this much solar, you can calculate this, right? It's very easy to calculate, but it's not accurate. Why is it not accurate? It ignores all the realities of dynamic electricity supply and demand, okay? And this is a big problem with a lot of the LCAs that you see in the literature. So what did we do? Well, we did a marginal emission rate. And again, props to Tristan Burton who, who came up with this analysis. But we are looking at the expected value of the change in electricity production CO2 rate due to an additional load divided by that additional load. So that's kind of a mouthful, but the idea is you add an electric vehicle to the grid, you add that load to the grid, what is the emissions rate that that's gonna cause? Right? This, is, this is actually very difficult to calculate. It, um, it's been taking us Many people are waiting for this paper. It's been taking us months and months to kind of do this. Now, granted, we, and by we, mainly Tristan is doing this in his, in his free time, but it's still a lot of work, right? It's been taking, taking a while. It requires a regression analysis of electricity grid supply and emissions data, including the effects of electricity imports from adjacent grids. Okay, there's a lot of math behind this, but it's data-driven. So you can't, really, you can't really say it's biased, right? It's data-driven. We're taking out assumptions and we're using actual data right? It's accurate. It's not completely accurate. Of course, nothing is, but it's far more accurate than using the, the total electricity mix. Okay, so what happens when we do this? So here's a teaser. Uh, the paper hasn't come out yet. Uh, we're about to submit the paper, hopefully. Tristan, if you're out there, hopefully soon. Um, but here is the emissions rate of the full hybrid electric vehicle minus the emissions rate of the BEV. So we're looking at the difference between the two in grams per CO2 per kilometer. Now on the left, you have the least favorable assumptions for BEVs. So that would be using the higher CO2 production level on that range that I talked about. On the right, and some other things as well. On the right, you have the most favorable assumptions for BEVs, okay? Now, where you see states that are light gray all the way up to black, a BEV will be cleaner, right? It'll, it'll create less CO2 per kilometer driven. Where you see light kind of pinkish all the way up to dark red, that's where the full hybrid electric will produce less CO2 per kilometer driven, okay? Now you can see for the least favorable assumptions for BEVs, the hybrid actually wins, wins in quotes, right? Because this is just one thing we're looking at. CO2 is actually just one part of the puzzle, right? There's also, uh, you know, local pollutants. There's also t uh, human toxicity potential. There's all these other things that should be considered as well. But if we're just going to focus on CO2 and greenhouse gases, then the hybrid wins in 44 states. If you look on the right, the hybrid wins in 25 states. Okay, so even with the most favorable assumptions for BEVs, the hybrid is still better in 20, 25 states. Why are we not pushing hybrids more, right? Why are we, why is all of this focus on BEVs? There should be a lot of focus on BEVs, don't get me wrong. You can see here in some states, they're much cleaner, right? But why are we not also focusing a lot of attention on hybrids? We need to reduce CO2 now, not just in the future, right? And this hybrids are the fastest way to get there. Okay, so that was the full hybrid. Now let's look quick at a plug-in hybrid. You know, again, these hybrid electric vehicles have both IC engines and electric motors and battery packs. Plug-in hybrids are actually charged from the grid, similar to uh, a battery electric vehicle, but then of course you also have a gas tank uh, and an engine. Okay, what can we do with these sorts of hybrid vehicles to try to get rid of some of the problems? Well, we can do something like geofencing. Right, so you see that little arrow moving across the bottom there. It's moving in and out of the city, right? So with geofencing, you can do things like, based on your location, if you're inside of an urban area, uh, you can switch to battery. It can switch to battery electric mode, right? That's going to be cleaner locally. Shorter distances in the urban areas are great for battery electric vehicles. It makes a ton of sense. But then when you leave the city, that's when you often need the range, right? And you don't have to. You don't want to have to worry about maybe infrastructure. And by the way, adding all this infrastructure for battery electric vehicles has its own CO2 footprint uh, involved. So 
So this kind of solution actually gives you essentially the best of both worlds. And if that, if the engine is, um, you know, I'll talk about renewable fuels. I don't want to jump the gun, but I'll talk a little bit about renewable fuels later. If it's powered by renewable fuels, that's even better. Okay, well, that's a good transition because when it comes to the IC engine and the demonization of it, it's a great, it's a great machine, right? The IC engine is a great machine. It's not the machine that's the problem. It's the fuel that's the problem, right? The fuel is what's creating the carbon emissions. The fuel is what fuel is what's creating the criteria pollutants. Okay, and so it's not the machine. It's the fuel. So what do we do about it? And I wish I had, you know, a lot of time to go into this. And, and our webinars in our webinar series will go much deeper into these topics. I just want to introduce the topics to you that there are low carbon and zero carbon fuels out there that we can potentially use to fuel our internal combustion engines. And we're already doing some of this biofuels with ethanol, for example. So biofuels, then you have e-fuels, which can be created from renewable electricity. You have hydrogen, you've heard a lot about hydrogen lately, and ammonia. Now, I don't wanna pretend like this is simple and this is solved and we just need to create these biofuels and e-fuels and we're good to go. There's still a lot of work to be done here to come up with a more efficient process to create these. Right? And there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. And there's a lot of research that is being done. I think there needs to be more, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think this is a big key to our decarbonization future for transportation. But again, more on, more on these uh, in the future. OK, not only that, though, it's a common misconception that engines have been pretty stagnant right? since they were introduced 100 years ago or so. I just want to show this plot because this shows the miles per gallon or the fuel efficiency from 1975 all the way through 2020. And this is showing an average US light duty vehicle fuel efficiency in yellow, and then a new passenger car fuel efficiency. So new models introduced to the market in red. And you can see that over the years, we've significantly improved uh, the efficiency of these internal combustion engines. Far from stagnant, a lot of work going on, a lot more work needs to be done. Now, why is there more work to be done? Well, I like to show this picture because it shows all of the variables that need to be optimized, right? To optimize for efficiency and for emissions. Now we've done a lot of work on these over the past decades, but there's more work to be done. Things like optimizing how the fuel is injected, how it's ignited, the shape of the combustion chamber, all of these things, right? Need to be optimized. And researchers around the world are working on this day in and day out. One of the ways we can do this now is with modern computing systems, supercomputing, cluster computing, cloud computing, we have access to all of this computing power that we can use to help us optimize, right? Optimize engine parameters. And this is work that's being done, including artificial intelligence and machine learning um, day in and day out. Okay, but your solver needs to be able to take advantage of how you're, how you're predicting the efficiency and emissions of an engine need to be uh, need to need to work well on all of these computers, right? So we call this scaling efficiency or speed up. So if you look at in particular our, our solver at Convergent Science, it's called Converge. You know, we, we make use of large number of cores very well. Um, and so this is something that you really need to be able to take advantage of to be able to optimize these engines in a quick, in a quick way, right? We all want a fast turnaround time. Now here's just an example uh, simulation image. This is using computational fluid dynamics and actually Converge to simulate an engine. Um, just showing all the different things included, the port fuel injection, the ignition. Um, you, can, you can include conjugate heat transfer to do solid temperatures in here. It's a pretty complicated process, but we have the tools now. And you can look at new engines that have come out, for example, the Mazda Skyactive X, right? The Mazda Skyactive X um, really improved the efficiency of the IC engine very recently. They use these tools in order to get to that point. So it's a very powerful way to do it. Okay, so I've talked a lot about uh, a lot of things actually, right? I've talked a lot about how battery electric vehicles aren't necessarily as green as, as we like. Now they are a huge part of the future solution, but I think IC engines are as well, hopefully with renewable fuels. But what are my recommendations? What should we do going forward? What are the takeaways here? So my first one is I would say we should be taking a balanced approach to transportation, recognizing that there is no silver bullet solution. None of the options that we have available today are the silver bullet, right? I don't believe in banning any particular technology. We need to set targets. So I believe the government should be setting targets, not necessarily banning one technology or another. Let the best technology win. If IC engines can't get us there, 
then they naturally go out, right? But don't, don't ban them because there are things we could be doing that we don't even know we could do yet, right? Look at battery electric vehicles today. 20 years ago, people would say, a lot of people would say, you're crazy when, when, you know, to think of getting the kind of range that we can get from a battery electric vehicle today, for example. We don't know what's around the corner. We have to keep working on all of these things. And the best technology varies depending on region, like I showed with the hybrid electric vehicle versus the battery electric vehicle, just in the US alone, depending on what state you're in, one is cleaner than the other. Uh, we should be using LCA when comparing technologies uh, as much as we can, despite these assumptions, and we need to keep improving LCA so we can make fewer and fewer of these assumptions that introduce bias, right? But including only the tailpipe emissions or even the use phase can significantly misrepresent a technology's environmental impact. And I think we need to continue to invest in ICE technology for three, three main reasons, really. I believe there's much untapped potential to still exploit. And I, see, I think we're seeing examples of this um, you know, coming out in, in the research. ICEs are going to be present in electrified vehicles for years to come, right? So all those hybrids we talked about, they all include internal combustion engines. And if we cease to invest in internal combustion engines, there is danger that we will lose the opportunity to improve that technology, right? What happens if electric cars don't meet expectations? I mean, we're putting a lot on the back of the electric vehicle. What if it doesn't meet expectations? We could be missing out on an opportunity to keep improving IC engines in parallel, right? Do both. I'm not suggesting we do just IC engines, do both. Okay, uh, I think we should be devoting significant resources to investigating carbon neutral fuels. Success in that area not only allows us to lower emissions in the current fleet, right? Forget about new cars. In the current fleet, we could be lowering emissions, but it also makes use of much of the current infrastructure. And that's a big, that's a big deal, right? If we can make use of our current infrastructure and you know, clean up our current vehicle fleet, as well as have new, cleaner cars in the future, that's a win-win for everybody. Hybrids are the fastest way to reduce CO2 emissions from vehicles. And I, they should be treated as such. I feel like hybrids um, should be giving a lot, should be getting a lot more love, um, not only in terms of government funding, but you know, in the media and you know, just because they have an IC engine, they kind of have the stain on them. Um, but I, I feel like there's, there's evidence out there that they are the fastest way to reduce CO2 emissions in at least the short term, maybe up to the medium term. And engineering, not politics, should drive future transportation policy. So to learn more, um, again, I wish I could have gone deeper into a lot of these topics, but we will have, as Tom mentioned, an ASME internal combustion engine division webinar series, which you should receive information for that in the fairly near future. And that will be a series of three to five, we're still finalizing, but three to five webinars between now and our fall technical conference, okay? And those talks will go deeper into things like renewable fuels and hybridization and how we use computer modeling to optimize engines. Okay, and a little shameless plug here, but if you do wanna learn more as well, uh, I recently wrote a book on this topic with uh, my co-author, Professor Felix Leach from the University of Oxford. And we wrote this book in a way that, you know, you don't have to be an expert on transportation propulsion technology to get something out of it. We tried to try to make it readable for, you know, the layman all the way up to the engineer. So you can learn more in, in this book as well. It comes out in May. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Senecal and Dr. Laverti. That was fantastic. And we had some amazing questions from the audience. Before we wrap this up, a word to the attendees that if you have topics that you would like to see presented at a future ASME Tech Talk series, we'd love to hear from you. To submit a topic, email ASME's Tech Operations Coordinator at hernandezk at asme.org. If you have colleagues who weren't able to join us today for this Tech Talk, it will be posted soon within the ASME members page for the Tech Talk series. I will also mention that next month's Tech Talk will take place on Thursday, April 2nd at 12 noon Eastern time on the topic of what makes viruses tick, mechanically speaking, with Professor Gao from Nanyang University in Singapore. Tom? Thanks, Barbara. Before closing, I'd like to just remind everyone about this year's Internal Combustion Engine Fall Technical Conference, which will be held October 13th through the 15th. Uh, it's going to be a virtual event that Dr. Caroline Gonzale and Dr. Kelly Senecal uh, will be um, hosting and be the conference chair and co-chair. 
Uh, they're organizing an exciting event, which is going to include keynote speakers and panel sessions to go along with high quality technical presentations. Please visit the conference website for details and plan on joining us uh, at this event. Also, we'd like to invite you to join our webinar series, which will go into more details on the future of the internal combustion engine. Uh, be a great follow on to today's discussion. This will be a free webinar series that'll be leading up to our fall conference and great opportunity to learn from some leading experts in the field. So please be on the lookout for upcoming announcements on that event. Barbara? Great. Lastly, if you are an ASME member and would like to join a technical division, visit asme.org and log into your account. There you can select up to five areas of interest, and by doing so, you become a member of that division. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.